It's a real pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Stephen Hell of uh, Max Planck Institute at Göttingen. So Stephen had made pioneering advances in super-resolution microscopy. As you all know, the spatial resolution of light mi microscopes had been uh, prevented people from seeing small features inside the cell. Attempts were made to circumvent this limitation. One approach was near-field microscopy, using a tiny object of light to deliver a point of uh, a tiny object to de uh, deliver a point of light. However, this object is highly invasive and only suited for surface imaging of the sample. I knew its limitation too well because I wasted some years in vain only to realize that it would not do much for biology. Stefan took a different approach. He was the first person to realize that one can break the diffraction limit with far field optics using a method uh, he called uh, engineering the point spread function of lenses that do not physically touch the sample. Since then, he has invented several brand new uh, techniques to achieve uh, nanometer spatial resolution, most notably STAT and RESOLVE, which he would explain in his lectures. So I knew Stefan for some time, ever since he set out to pursue super resolution microscopy. I would like to share some stories about his past that I hope young scientists here find inspiring. Stefan received his PhD in physics in 1990 from University of Heidelberg. He did postdoctoral work at EMBL and completed his habilitation in physics in 1996 at the University of Heidelberg. Heidelberg is a stimulating place where students have a lot of freedom to explore in research. I normally would uh, mention research advisors, but uh, in this case, it's not quite uh, necessary. Without insulting anybody, uh, I think uh, Stefan is way more famous than his former advisors. I guess I'm saying his uh, pedigree was less than outstanding. Perhaps because of that, he was exiled to Finland at University of Turtu for a few months, uh, where he was a, a principal investigator of light microscopy group, leading a, a small group, a junior group. But this is where he started to shine, pioneered the idea of circumventing the diffraction limit with far field optics. From 1997 to 2002, at Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, he uh, did pioneering work on uh, STAT, and in 2001, Göttingen made him a, a tenure offer, and that was an exception um, for him to become a director at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, the only uh, exception they made before was uh, Irving Nia, who received Nobel Prize for his invention on the patch clamp technique. What impressed me most about Stefan are, first, he's highly original, and has the courage to challenge the conventional wisdom, even at a time when nobody else thought it was possible. His work has made broad impact, uh, impact as you can see uh, at this meeting. And I think a good indication of the influence of his work is that it's not that other people simply replicate his microscopes, but that his work has stimulated others to invent other super resolution techniques. Second, a reflection of the impact of uh, Stefan's work is that his microscopes have been commercialized by Leica and now also by a barrier, a new startup company of his, which has some flyers here uh, at the conference, I believe. Uh, that said, I have no connection with that. I'm not collecting any commission for mentioning it here. Perhaps I should. So finally, Stefan continues to innovate 
two weeks ago, I had the pleasure visiting him in Göttingen. Once again, I saw a lot of new developments, some of them you hear tonight. So without further ado, let's give him, uh, let me give the floor to him. Welcome, Stefan Hell. Thank you very much, Sunny, for this very kind, uh, personal, very generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. I thank you and, of course, all the other organizers, Xiaowei, Atsushi, Rafa. Um, yeah, it's, uh, of course, a privilege to uh, give this talk tonight and to yeah, tell you the story about super resolution and its basic principles. Now, we all know that um, um, throughout the um, uh, 20th century, it was widely accepted, it was widely believed that the resolution of any light focusing microscope at the end of the day, for all practical purposes, is limited to about half the wavelength of light, or to be more precise, to a value uh, of d, which is given by the wavelength divided by twice the numeric aperture of the objective lens. Now, um, this has been, so to speak, uh, the general, uh, say, say uh, basis of what people have saw that a light microscope is able to do. And, um, of course, many other techniques have been developed, as I just mentioned, that have been, of course, very successful and very powerful, not at least the electron microscope. At the end of the 20th century, the gold standard in uh, focusing light microscopy became the confocal microscope. And the confocal microscope was very important because it provided background suppression and it allowed us to do three-dimensional imaging non-invasively, especially in living cells. However, the spatial resolution of confocal microscopy was still limited by diffraction to typically about, uh, say, 200, 300 nanometers. And so in this particular case, of course, we have an object, um, a set of proteins that is, it has been recorded confocally, but as you can see, it's not possible to see any details. Now, the development of STED microscopy at the turn of this century showed that you can really fundamentally overcome the diffraction barrier. There is land, so to speak, beyond the diffraction barrier. And so we've, since we have developed this technique, I have now the option to show you an image that has been recorded with that, and now you can see the details much, much better uh, and see what it is. In fact, these are nuclear pore complexes from uh, epithelial cell line of Xenopus levis, and if you zoom in, of course, you see the details actually quite nicely. In fact, these nuclear pore complexes consist of eight subunits, and why can you see them? Well, because the spatial resolution has been improved in this case over confocal by an order of magnitude. Now, an order of magnitude uh, of resolution improvement really tells you a different story. That's very clear. I can't resist comparing it with a confocal microscope. And now you see that yeah, this opens, of course, many, many possibility, possibilities. Now, as you may think, or you may think perhaps that in order to record such state images, you require very complicated setups and, and systems. In fact, uh, this recording was taken by a student in a student lab course setup. So if you think about that, then you will realize that the advancements that were actually made um, that has allowed us to get to this type of images cannot be technical or primarily technical. Of course, improved detectors, lasers, and so on played a role. But the advancement or the crossing of the diffraction barrier was certainly due to fundamental, say, insights, if you will, or very fundamental basic phenomena. And since I'm giving a keynote lecture today, I thought it's worthwhile speaking about these fundamental principles. And besides that, well, I've always seen this resolution question as a scientific quest. Is it possible to get beyond the diffraction barrier? And if it is, then why? What's the reason why we can get now these pictures, but maybe 20 years back, we couldn't? And this must have a very clear reason. I would like to talk about that, about the basic principles. Now, in order to explain the basic principles to you, of course, I'm coming back to very simple schemes. Now, this is just an object. Uh, consisting of many molecules. They, these molecules are labeled since we do fluorescence microscopy. And what will happen if you shine light on them? They will be raised from the ground state to the excited state, and they come down, hopefully, by emitting a fluorescent photon, and that light is recorded by a detector or by the eye. Now, it's clear that we can separate features that are further away than the diffraction barrier. The problem of separation of the resolution exists only within a if you will, diffraction limited range of around, say, 200 to 300 nanometers as given by this equation coined by Ernst Abbe. 
In other words, if we manage to sort out uh, the features within that range of about 200 to 300 nanometers, find a solution for separating, say, the strands residing here within this 200 nanometer range, we have sorted out the problem completely. Because once we have a solution for that range, we can apply that to the rest of it. So we just concentrate on that and so I can explain everything within this, say, typical range. Because once I have a solution, I can apply it to the rest of the, of the object, and we're done. So it's safe to concentrate just on that region and to ask, why can't we separate the features residing within this 200 nanometer zone? Well, one way of saying it is because we cannot concentrate the excitation light any further. If we could concentrate the excitation light further, as in near-field optics, we could concentrate, for example, the excitation light just on that strand, and then we could see that strand, and later on that strand, and so on. But in far-field microscopy, in a focused in light microscope, this is not possible. All of the features will be flooded at the same time with excitation light, and hence give off light at the same time, scatter light back, fluorescence light back, and so no detector will be able to tell these features apart. Now, if this is the problem, that all of them are flooded with excitation light, and all of them give light back simultaneously, a solution to the problem, of course, is to make sure that not all of the molecules that are flooded with excitation light, inevitably, are capable of sending light back. So in other words, you can say, while we can't change the fact that all of them are flooded with excitation light, maybe we can't, can change the fact that all of them are sending light back. And if we can classify them, so to speak, some that send light back and some that don't, we can separate them. And this is actually the basic idea behind uh, the STAD microscope. In the STAD microscope, you use a beam of light that shuts off molecules. So as you, perhaps all of you know, that beam is redshifted in wavelengths so that, such that it, it instantly de-excites, potentially excited molecules down to the ground state, just gets a molecule down to the ground state, and then they are not able to scatter fluorescent light back. So here, the molecules are flooded with a beam that is usually donut-shaped. We don't want to shut all of them off. We want to leave some, some molecules out. And now, those molecules are not capable of sending light back. They remain dark while those in the center are still able to send light back. And so we can separate them and get a higher spatial resolution we just, because we get just signal from those molecules. Now, why this would give us some improved spatial resolution, obviously, of course, we would like to do better. And this can, um, can be done, of course, by making sure that the molecules that are, reside also in here and in here are also silent, are also shut off, not only those on, on the periphery. Now, what's the condition for that? The condition for that is easily found. In order to shut off a molecule by stimulated emission, not only you have to have the right wavelengths, you also have enough photons in the air. You have to have enough, say, photons that fall on a molecule because once you have enough photons beyond a certain threshold, you can be sure there is always a photon, say, encountered by the molecule that kicks the molecule down in the case the molecule is excited. So once you pass a certain threshold, you can say you've switched the molecule off, and you have not allowed them to assume the excited state, and hence switch, switch it off. You have deprived it of its ability to send light back. And so what we have to do in order to shut off also those molecules, it's very obvious, we have to to increase the, the intensity of the donor such that the threshold moves in. And now also these molecules are turned off and we get signal only from here. And this is what we want. Now we can separate signal from this trend from, um, from signal from the rest. But how we get the rest? Of course, uh, we have to move the beam. Keep in mind, all of the molecules here are flooded with excitation light, but only these ones are allowed to emit. Those are silenced. And the rest, of course, we get just by moving the beam as I said, now we get a signal from here, and then we get a signal in here. They are forced to emit sequentially in time because we play this on-off game. And this is how we separate the features and now can disentangle the features residing within this 200 nanometer range. Now, in fact, you can tune the spatial resolution, obviously, by moving the threshold in and out. If so, if you reduce the intensity of the donut, it doesn't change its shape, of course, but the threshold just moves in and out. Of course, then the resolution is poorer. If you increase it further, and the resolution will get up further. And the resolution is now not determined by Abbe's equation anymore. Uh, it can be described by a modified version of Abbe's equation. So what comes in is, of course, the threshold, because that tells us where the molecule turned off, and the total brightness of the donut. So the peak intensity is found in here. This is I. And the threshold intensity is 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 found in here. And the ratio of the two and the square root gives us 
this distance d, which eventually determines the spatial resolution. It gives us the region in which the molecules are allowed to emit, whereas in the rest of the area they are turned off. So one way of thinking about this, and if you have an optics background, you, you may be prone to thinking about that way, is to think, OK, this is non-linearity what's going on here. Because, say, having a threshold and shifting the threshold to the center is, if you will, a saturated transition that is taken advantage of in this particular case. I agree with that. But a, a word of warning, non-linearity is not the best line of thinking for very fundamental reasons. If you really want to understand these concepts properly, and all, all the ramifications, of course, also the power and limitations, what we actually do is we transiently prepare the molecules in two distinct states. That's what we do. That's the only purpose of this being. Keep it here in the ground state. Do not allow these molecules to assume the S1, whereas in here, they are, so to speak, forced to assume the S1. So here then S0, here then S1. And because we prepare the molecules in two different states, we can separate them. Although all of them are flooded with excitation light, but they are in different states. They can send light back, but those can't send light back. And because these can send light, by, light back, we can separate them from the rest. That's the whole, uh, whole story in a nutshell. And as I said, we get the rest of the molecules just by moving this beam across the 200 nanometer zone. Um, and of course, we always know where the signal comes from because that's preset actually by the zero of the donut. That's predetermined. OK, and so the signal here gives us, um, is proportional to the number of molecules that are found in here. So potentially many molecules that are in that range. Typically, there are many molecules. So how do we get the rest? Well, it's very simple. We could move the beam like that. And then you can imagine uh, we get an image that is, say, 10 by 10 micron or whatever, or even larger. But of course, the larger the area gets, the longer it will take to take it in the image. Because if you move a beam like that, um, the recording time scales with the area. That's very obvious. Is there a way to improve the recording speed? Yes, you can parallelize things. As I said, you need to sort out, uh, the donor needs to sort out uh, the, the features just within that 200 nanometer range. And so if you're having many of them to parallelize the imaging process, we can be much faster, as you see here, and hence record with a CCD camera or something. Uh, we don't have to worry that the signal from here is confounded with that from here, because it's further away than obvious diffraction barrier. So we need for one, uh, the 200 nanometer zone only one, say, um, say uh, donut, so to speak. They are sparse enough in order to be separated. The separation has to happen within a 200 nanometer range. Of course, um, parallelized, say, subdiffraction resolution imaging was first done as structured illumination, pioneered by, by Mats Gustafsson and Rainer Heinzmann. And this is, of course, very well known as a concept. You can also use lines. They have to be further away than the diffraction barrier. But if you use lines, you have to turn the lines to get also the resolution in the other direction. Now, in the beginning, of course, especially for STETS, since STETS requires relatively intense beams, we used single beams um, that were scanned like that, and including, let's say, the commercially available microscopes, uh, so far, use uh, single beams. And I would like to show you a number of examples and bri bri of applications, quickly browse through them. Um, well, this is a relatively early one. So this is a protein called Brook Pilot. Uh, was found actually by a colleague at the synapse, and he knew that it played an important role in structuring the synapse, but he didn't know how. So stat microscopy showed for the first time that it forms these little baskets. Now, say, collaborating with him, more recently we labeled different proteins or different protein ends, and it was found, of course, um, you can find their, um, say, arrangement in space. It is a comparison with confocal after mathematical treatment never gets as good as a stat after mathematical treatment, obviously. And so what you do is you, um, what you, do is you can get, actually, from your data a three-dimensional model of the, um, of the features in here, of the uh, protein arrangement. And what I like as a physicist is that the numbers here are 30, 40, 50 nanometers, but the responsible wavelength is 750 nanometers. So it's a fraction of the wavelength. And although everything is here as a fraction of the wavelength, we can really tell it apart this focus in light. Far field optics. This is taken from a Drosophila. So you can get a nanoscale arrangement of proteins at a, at a synapse just by, um, uh, say, overcoming the diffraction barrier. Now, this is another um, uh, applicational study. Um, HIV um, is typically about 140 nanometers in diameter, and um, an important protein on the HIV surface is this protein called ENF. It's found in about 7 to 14 clusters of proteins, but people had no clue how it's distributed on. On, um, on the HIV surface. 
Now, confocal microscopy, if you label it by, by an antibody and a dye, uh, cannot resolve the pattern. That may be there. Instead, clearly resolve the pattern. As you can see in here and now, uh, you see that some of them have the ends all in a single place. Some of them have patterns. And if you correlate it in space with the HIV, um, it was found that this N protein distribution strongly correlates with the maturation level of, of the HIV particle. To cut a long story short, it means that in order to be capable of infecting the next cell, uh, the ENVs have to be more or less all in the same place, because otherwise um, it's, it's not mature, not capable of, of doing that. So a technical remark. Um, of course, different dyes have different excitation um, spectra, that's clear. And you know, of course, that you can excite with maybe one wavelength two different dyes. And the same applies in many cases uh, actually to STAT. You can use one STAT wavelength to turn off several dyes if they're not spectrally too distinct. And this has been done in here. So here in this recording, we use just a single laser um, at 775 nanometer to silence two dyes. So in one case, you get something like 20 nanometer, the other one 30 nanometer spatial resolution. And because both dyes were silenced simultaneously, you have perfect colocalization because the position of the emitter is imprinted by the donut, by the position of the zero. And so you have a perfect correlation uh, in space. Another application, uh, of course, uh, for those that are interested in, in the neurophysiology, and um, of course, in the end, you want to see neurons in action in vivo, straight in the, in the living system, in a living mouse, for example. And so here we used a transgenic mouse um, and, and provided a cranial window here by just opening the skull and focusing through a cover slip. And you see some of the neurons of this mouse um, expressed cytosolically, the yellow fluorescent protein. And so we recorded. Um, in a stat modality, um, those neurons um, repeatedly. And you can see that this is taken on a, on a minutes uh, scale, that on that scale, there are slight movements going on. So it's actually quite nice to see them. And this was, not, this was only speculated before these um, results were made. Obviously, the brain is plastic, and, and this dendritic spines play a very, very important role. And um, um, these are postsynaptic sites, obviously. I think. Um, this kind of demonstration shows that there's a realistic chance to go into the brain and study the synapse uh, here straight in the, uh, in the living mouse. And this is just a starting point. And so next step is, of course, to, to disentangle protein distribution and so on. This will certainly come. The spatial resolution is about three to four times better than what you have in the uh, standard confocal or, or two-photon microscope. Another example. So this was recordings on the minute scale. Uh, unfortunately, the room is not dim enough to see all the details in here, but it doesn't matter. You still get the gist of it. Here, you see neuropeptide vesicles moving along no motor neurons. Why am I showing you this? Because it was recorded at 125 frames per second. So it's very fast recording. So the display is actually four times slower than the actual recording. It shows you can be fast with that and at the same time have an improvement of spatial resolution. Here, in this case, it's about 70 nanometers. Uh, what's, the, what's, setting, what's setting the limit to the speed? Um, it's the brightness of the floor for in the end. The scanning can be made very fast, obviously. So this is an example of very fast um, scanning. If things become too fast, like molecules diffusing on the membrane, things go very quick, then you can say, OK, I do away with image it, imaging and use um, STAT, for example, as a way to measure the diffusion very locally, say, with high spatial definition, and see how molecules diffuse through um, the subdiffraction area. And this is called, for example, STAT uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, if you combine it with STAT. But the advantage here is that you can probe much smaller scales. And for those of you interested in, in that area of application, the question is, how small can you make that scale? And so in recent applications, um, we show that in uh, artificial membranes, you get down to 15 um, nanometers in diameter. In live cell membranes, something like 20 nanometers. And this is uh, of course, quite a lot if you compare uh, the diffraction uh, resolution or the barriers set by the confocal microscope to about 250 nanometers. So there are many interesting applications you can imagine doing with, with this. It's an interesting alternative to using single molecule tracking, which is also very valuable. But the STAT FCS has the advantage that you can be faster. You can record faster, and you get, go straight to a, a certain uh, area of interest. So talking about resolution. The question that comes up now, if one talks about the basic principles, what, what is the resolution that you can get? You've seen all kinds of numbers, 70, 
50, uh, 20, um, uh, 15 nanometers. Well, it's clear that the resolution is determined, of course, by, um, uh, say, if you will, the, the region, the coordinate um, in which the molecules is allowed to emit in this case. So we set up a difference in states, obviously. Here the molecules are allowed to emit. And so um, we can make the resolution very large by shutting off more molecules. And so D is, of course, given by this um, uh, uh, inverse square root law, I over IS. And you can imagine now that um, the, um, the resolution D can be augmented even further down in the equation goes down to zero. But what does zero mean? It means actually the size of a molecule. And so if we're having two molecules sitting very close to each other, in this concept, of course, we can separate the two. Because if the area here is just the size of a molecule, we see just that molecule. And the molecule right next to it is silence, is dark. And if you want to see the next one, we just go, go, to, the, uh, go to it and sh uh, turn this one on, whereas this one is kept dark. And so just getting a few photons uh, is enough to getting for, for separating the two, because uh, the positioning of the molecules, the position of the molecules is predetermined by the photons that go in. So the donut beam predetermines with its many, many photons where the position is located. And so we can separate them just with a few photons deterministically. OK, so this is the conceptual uh, limit. But in, you will ask, of course, conceptually is fine, but what's the practical limit? Well, the practical limit is determined by the intensity minimum. So the donut has to be 0 in practice, lower than 1%. The number of state cycles, this is a nice way of saying the molecule should not bleach. So it should go off, but should come back. That's the point. State cycles it should go many times between S0 and S1. And of course, um, in practical cases, if you have a, a well sorted out stat microscope and everything fits well, you should get 25 nanometer spatial resolution without mathematical uh, treatment. But um, the question comes up now. Um, let's assume we had already a perfect floor for. How far could we go? Are there such perfect flow force? Well, as physicists, you can in instantly come up with uh, perfect flow force. And these are so-called fluorescent color centers in, in solids. And one of them is uh, uh, the charged nitrogen vacancy color center in diamond, which has been studied especially by Jörg Wachtrup on a single molecule level, did a lot of pioneering work and beautiful physics by him and also by other colleagues in the States. And we have used. Um, here, the uh, stat to confine the region in which that little defect is allowed to assume the fluorescent state down to about 8 nanometers using 775 nanometer. Now, here the experiments actually were limited by spherical aberrations. So if you focus into diamond, diamond has a large intercept refraction, you have spherical aberrations. So what did we do? So we made a, a, a round, um, say, a, um, diamond. In this case, spherical aberration is reduced, and you can get the, the number further down. So down to 4.2 nanometers. This is just the physics that determines the state has uh, here is on and here it's off. And if you, if you do it further, you get to 2.4 nanometer. And I think if you do further refinements, you will end up with smaller numbers. And this is kind of interesting to, to decrease the number. So you may say, OK, this is a gimmick now. So what, what is this uh, good for? Well, it can be good for, or it is good for, in the material sciences. And as I, I can indicate to you, not, perhaps not only there. Why? Because these charged nitrogen vacancies are interesting because they are paramagnetic. They form triplets. And you can use um, that state in order, in order to probe external magnetic fields. Um, the reason is the following. You can probe it optically. Because depending on the MS quantum number, they have a different brightness. If they are in MS equals 0, they are about 30% brighter than in the MS plus or minus 1 state. So if, you, if they are in MS equals 0, you pump light on it, it's, it's always brighter than in MS plus minus 1. And of course, you can drive the transition from MS, plus, uh, from MS 0 to MS plus minus 1 by microwaves of different frequencies. And if the frequency fits, of course, you, they go to the other state. And not only that, by applying in a magnetic field, of course, you get a, a split here. Uh, and then the split here in the line will tell you the size of the magnetic field if you know the orientation of, of this charge line. So it's great can read out magnetic field with, with far field optics, with fluorescence. But again, you face the diffraction resolution limit. So if those little things are coming too close, then you cannot separate the signal. And you cannot read out the magnetic field. And this is a pity, because they are just atomic size. These atomic size sensors, fantastic magnetic sensors. But the fraction barrier poses a problem. So in, the, in this case, what do we do is we do that. We overcome the diffraction barrier. And now we can separate 
this little, say, um, defects, atomic size defects individually. And now we see the signal from this one. It's measured here, the magnetic field. Then we go to this one, we get this magnetic field. And we go to this one, get that magnetic field. Why can we separate the magnetic fields? Because at a time we record the magnetic field of this one, all these features are off. They are not able to emit. Only this one is able to, to signal. And this is how we can separate them. Of course, this is the whole spectrum. Um, can we do better in that? In, uh, as far as, regard, uh, as, far, um, as finding out the position is concerned? Yes, of course. You can, of course, calculate the centroid of each of these individual emitters. And then you know exactly where they're located. They're atomic sized, of course. It's 1.4 nanometer because this is the number of photons that, that uh, the number of photons give us this, say, positioning precision or coordinate precision of each of these uh, emitters. And so this is quite handy. You can imagine now having a magnetic field sensor that potentially in the future reads out magnetic fields of, I don't know, picked up by proteins. That's the, at least the vision of uh, Michel Lukin on Waltzworth and York Bachtrup. And uh, maybe that works out in the end. So if you change the magnetic field, of course, you, you see the change in spectrum. So that's it. OK, now with that example, I'm um, coming back to um, the very basics again. So the on-off principle is actually the um, underlying phenomenon that has allowed us to, to overcome the diffraction barrier. So if you have this molecule and this is too close to the other one, we shut it off to see this one, and vice versa, or feature, or whatever. Now, this on-off principle is, in fact, a two-state principle. And in my personal view, this two-state principle was underestimated in the past, or it, it has, was not seen, or, 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 or I think it, should, it has a lot of potential. And this is why I would like to explain it in, a, in very, very simple words to, to make the power of this concept, of this line of thinking, say, obvious to you. So what does it mean? As I explained, we overcome the diffraction barrier in stat microscopy by making sure that the molecules falling within the 200 nanometer range are not at the same time in the same state. Here they are allowed to occupy the S1, whereas in here they are forced to reside in a ground state. Although they are all flooded with excitation light within that 200 nanometer range. That allows us to tell these things apart. Now, as I also mentioned, in order to do that, you need intensities of the order of megawatt per square centimeter. So why that? It's very simple. Because that lifetime, the lifetime of the excited state is only for about a nanosecond. So if you want to create this difference in states, we have only about a nanosecond of time. Within that short period of time, we have to create this difference in states. So we have to hurry up, pumping in those wet photons to make sure that within that nanosecond, we have this difference in states. So it tells you that this intensity has a lot to do with the lifetime of the states. We want to set up a difference in states that lasts longer and if we manage that, we can, of course, play the same game at much lower light levels because there's more time to set up this difference in states. And so, although I must say that that is a very universal and very fundamental phenomenon for overcoming the diffraction barrier. Why? Because every flow of four has an S1 and it has an S0. And so you can apply it to, say, any organic dye. You can apply it to fluorescent proteins, to quantum dots. And so it's a very, very basic phenomenon. There are, of course, subtleties. There are other states as well, which have to be observed. But as a basic phenomenon, it applies to any flow form. But that doesn't mean it's the best in all cases. Maybe there are other on-off states or two states that we can set up here uh, at a longer time scale, with much more time, and then break the diffraction barrier at lower light levels. And the first alternative that came into my mind was to use a dark state, a long-lived dark state, a metastable state, pump it to a triplet state, and then here, the molecules stay for longer, about a microsecond. And then, again, how do you do that? You can pump very hard. The molecule ends up here in a triplet state. You do a spin flip, so to speak. And then here, it's in a dark state. The metastable dark state, but here, it's in a bright state, in a singlet state. And now you can separate them. All of them flood with excitation light, but only these ones are allowed to emit, and so you can separate them. The advantage, the conceptual advantage, is that here, uh, the molecules um, have this difference in states for about a microsecond. And so you don't have to hurry up to put in the photons so quickly. So the intensity requirement here is about a kilowatt per square centimeter. Now, once you realize that you can flip a spin in order to do this, then you know, well, you can perhaps also flip an atom, do a cis trans isomerization. For example, um, here we have the molecules in a cis state. And let's assume that the molecules uh, in a cis state are bright and they emit. Uh, fluorescently, and then you pump it, say, with blue light to the trans state, 
Now here they are in a trance state again. You flood everything with excitation light, but here in the system they can emit here in the trance, and so you can separate them. You play the same game as with stat microscopy, move the donut around, move the zero around, and you get a picture, but at much lower light levels. Why? Because the, the state lifetime is much longer, so you have time to set up these differences in states. You have much more time to set up differences in states for milliseconds or seconds, and you bump it back and forth, and so you reduce the intensity quite a lot. Now, fortunately, cis-trans isomerization like that and related process can be made with photoswitchable uh, fluorescent protein. And, and Natsushi Miyawaki, of course, as you all know, has pioneered um, the, the switching of, um, of GFP and GFGFP-like proteins. Um, and so we worked actually quite a long time to get proteins that we felt are suitable for being switched back and forth many times, because this is what you have to do if, if you scan like that. And so we, we came up with um, a number of proteins. Um, uh, the first one was this one cited here. Um, and this has allowed us to do, a, as I said, a stat-like recording, but at much lower light levels, so five orders of magnitude um, lower light levels. And um, this is very interesting because it, it allows us to go to um, much lower intensities in living cells or uh, living tissues such as brain and still go substantially beyond uh, the diffraction barrier, as is shown in this example. Um, in here, for example, two hours of continuous scanning showed no visible photo damage. This is not to say that that STAT is, of course, totally, say, um, yeah, outperformed at this point. STAT still maintains the advantage of being able to turn off things instantly and has been done, as you've seen in a live cell. But again, this uses much, much lower light levels. It has a lot of potential to be developed further. Now, once you know that you can do the whole thing with very little light, then you know, oh, if I'm just taking my 50 milliwatt, 100 milliwatt CW laser out of the box, I can spread it over a large field of view and paralyze the imaging process. Now, one thing you may think of when, when it comes to paralyzation is to use structural illumination, use stripes, as a la um, Heinzmann and Mats Gustafsson. Uh, but then you have to turn the stripes. But if you think about it, you may say, okay, why not just crossing the pattern just like that? Why don't we cross the pattern? And in the first moment, you may think that if you cross the pattern, the resolution in the focal plane that we get is not isotropic. We will get a kind of sphere, uh, sorry, a, 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 a box uh, uh, in here. It would be quadratic because of the symmetry. But if you think about it, you will realize this won't be the case. Why? Because of the square root law. Here, the distance to the maximum, to the crest, is, of course, um, smaller. Here it is larger by a square root of 2. But because the intensity is crossed like that, at a crossing point, they will have twice the value. And because this is twice the value, the square root law tells us that the larger distance will be compensated just by this um, factor of 2. And so what we end up with is that the region in which the molecules will be allowed to emit will become spherical. And so you have isotropic spatial resolution right away just by crossing two patterns because of the square root law. And the only thing you have to do now is take a camera, record everything so these are sparse enough so that they are separated, parallelized instantly, you move them, and just 10 steps in this direction, 10 steps in this direction gives you a large field of view by applying many, many donuts, if you will, uh, zeros. And this has been done in here. So this is a wide field recording. This is the corresponding resolved recording, raw data. So it's just taken the data on a camera and, and grabbed. And this was recorded in a second. 120 by 100 microns living cell. Why? Because it was recorded with over 100,000 uh, donuts or zeros. And you can do a million if you, if you want to have a larger field of view. And you need a, something like an 80 or 100 milliwatt uh, continuous wave laser for doing that because the on-off switching is done at very, very low light levels. This is just another example, a bit more fancy. It was recorded for about three seconds, two seconds, three seconds. Again, 100,000 donuts simultaneously just say, 14 scanning steps, and that's it. So it shows that you can paralyze this. So why didn't we do this before we step? Because you need high intensities. And so we had to wait to develop this low light level concept um, to, to go to a seriously working, say, highly paralyzed subdiffraction resolution imaging. Now, then, of course, you may say, oh, now that we use for the switchable proteins and have large air detection and camera view, how does it compare with Palm Storm. Well, Palm Storm certainly was a seminal discovery. And of course, Palm Storm is fundamentally different to STAT and Resolve. Because in the STAT Resolve case, we use 
a pattern of light and zeros to determine where the molecules are on and off. But in the palm storm, as we all know, we don't do that. Of course, we use on and off, and in this case, the same, say, uh, state transitions. But here, it's switched on randomly in space. It requires signal molecules. So the discovery of, of seeing signal molecules, of course, important, a fundamental ingredient in this concept. Once you turn on one molecule, you can separate it from the rest, flood everything with excitation light, but you get signal only from here. As we all know, you don't know where it is, but no problem. You find out the position with the molecule, with the photons that have been emitted from the molecule. That's also a requirement. You need many photons emitted from them that place. You don't need that here. And then, of course, you project it on a camera, know the position, turn it off again, go to the next, turn it off, and do the same game, and reconstruct it optically. So the name Storm is actually a very good name because it really shows that you have a stochastic in space kind of on-off switching and then uh, this reconstruction. And so, so this has, of course, many advantages, such as one on-off cycle is enough. You need only to switch, for, to get one image, to, to switch the molecule on once and off, of course, again. So one on-off on -off cycle is enough. Here you need to switch the molecule many times. That's a disadvantage here. Here the advantage is that you need just one photon per m molecule. So it's very effective in terms of, of, um, of, of making a quick decision because you can just need just a few photons and you know where you are. And this has been used in a very recent study, for example, for tracking uh, signal, signal proteins on, um, on DNA. Some of you have, have seen it uh, published uh, recently in Nature Matters. Anyway, here, of course, because you need to localize the molecule, you need many many photons coming out on the same molecule. So this, here the molecules have to be bright in emission, but there can be lousy switches here. They have to be very good switches, but, but it's not so important that they are, they are fundamentally bright. Okay, now, um, of course, you don't need to have a c trans isomerization also in a stochastic method. You can pump everything to a dark state and have one molecule left over or one that comes back spontaneously. This is the idea behind, say, depleting the ground state. So it's the same mechanism as, as you've seen before, but done in a stochastic way. And this worked out well, because you cannot do the cycling with ground state depletion more often than four times time, usually with normal dice. And this is why it worked out so beautifully here um, in, um, uh, in the stochastic method, in the storm pond like method. And of course, storm pond is inherently elegantly paralyzed. You don't need any structure uh, and so on. You just may have to make sure that the next molecule is further away than diffraction barriers. It's instantly paralyzed. It's one of the reasons why it has become so successful. Now, this one is dedicated to Xiao Wei. Um, uh, I think a very important discovery that was made with, with STORM was um, uh, this arrangement of the actin structure in the axon. Now, if some of you had doubts about the structure, here they are with that. And so very clear, very beautiful, and again, it required the breaking of the diffraction barrier, the super resolution, in order to see these, um, see these details, as has been nicely shown, actually, in the Xiaowei study. Now, a few more insights. PSF, OTF, if you have an optics background, point spread function, transfer function. What happens with the point spread function, transfer functions? Of course, in both of these methods, the point spread function is sharpened, not just in this one, also in this one. They are both sharpened. They have to be sharpened because the point spread function is a function, a, a function, a linear function that, or uh, the imaging is a linear, is a, is, a, is a linear function that has a function, namely the point spread function that tells us how an object, a point like object, is relayed into the image. And of course, um, palm, storm, instead have point spread functions, which is not, by the way, the diffraction pattern that you have on a camera or on a detector. It's a complex function of the molecular state. So this is very important. So just with waves, you won't be able to describe neither the point spread function of the state nor that of the storm pond. They depend on the stochastic molecular state transition. But both sharpen the point spread function. This is, and this must be the case. Otherwise, um, they would not be valid as imaging methods. Another insight I would like to, to give you. Um, we can instantly agree on the fact that this stat result is a nonlinear optical modality, if you like. You can say that uh, we use a saturated transition in order to get here. But then, palm storm, would that be a linear modality? Doesn't make any sense. Why? Because it used the same molecular transitions. How can this be nonlinear and this linear if they use identical molecular transition? Doesn't make any sense. So if you think about it from the optics viewpoint, then you realize that, of course, palm storm is also nonlinear. But there is a major difference in nonlinearity. Here, the nonlinearity stems from the many photons that produce a single event, namely the localization here. So this is nonlinear 
in terms of the photons that come out. And this is nonlinear in terms of the photons that go in. So that's the point. You need the many photons to find where it is. And here also, you need many photons in order to determine the position. A single photon cannot be used to doing anything about positioning. Why? Because a single photon that would be coming out of the laser and go here would go astray, would go this way or that way or that way, we don't know. You need many photons to set up this difference in state and to determine the position of the emission in a stat or resolved microscope. So you need many photons. It's not just working with one photons. And this is, so to speak, um, the fundamental requirement. Just as you need many photons to come out from the sample in order to determine the position. With one photon, it wouldn't work because the one photon could come from anywhere within that region. So when it comes to positioning, finding out position or defining positioning, you have to use many photons, m photons. That's the point. But that's just the position. That's just the position. The separation is, of course, very important because, as I said, we need to tell things apart within this 200 nanometer range. And the separation is, of course, done by a state transition. As I said, loosely by playing the on-off game, on and off. This is how, how we um, uh, are able to tell things apart. And on and off is, of course, represented by states. Uh, a bright state and a dark state. A state that is capable of sending light back and a state that is not capable of sending light back. And once you realize that, then you know that this is a rather, say, fundamental principle. You can have many, say, state pairs, as you've seen here, that allow you to play these games with many advantages and disadvantages, different lifetimes and with different chemical requirements. But in the end, it's the same story. Um, and of course, you can have fluorescent and non-fluorescent, but it's not fundamentally tied to fluorescent and non-fluorescent. So it could also be absorbing, non-absorbing, scattering, non-scattering, spin up, spin down, green, blue, bound, diffusing, still moving. And I think um, we've seen already first studies that, that uh, actually push the, those principles um, away from, from fluorescent. I'm sure this will come, uh, there will be people coming up with, with clever ideas so, uh, to have super resolution, not only in the fluorescent case. And with that, of course, I'm coming to basically my final slide. Um, well, as I said, towards the 20th century, people believed that the end of the world in the far field optics is the confocal microscope. That's the best spatial resolution. We know now that we can do much better. We can, of course, um, expand this equation very easily, plugging in the square root factor. And now we know that we can get the d down to the size of a molecule, so down to zero. But the point that I'm making here is, why can we separate now this strand from that strand, but we can't do that here? Well, it's very simple. At a time, they were say, flooded with excitation lights simultaneously. The molecules of this feature were in the S0, whereas in that feature, they were in the S1, and then vice versa. This is why we can separate them. That's the that's the point. And so, what I'm saying is diffraction barrier is broken by preparing the molecules of adjacent features transiently in two different states. Of course, you can do more states if you want, but two states are enough. With two states, you can fundamentally overcome the diffraction barrier. And all these, say, uh, terminologies like point spread function, optical transfer function, pass by nonlinearity, they become dodgy. Why do they become dodgy? Because they were coined with waves in mind. Point spread function, transfer function, pass band, this has waves, and the waves should go through the opening of the lens. Nonlinearity is always about number of photons, usually. And so this is, um, these concepts become dodgy. And this is why I'm saying do away with them. They made a lot of sense. You can still work with them, but it's time to give them up. It's thinking of the 60s, 70s, 80s of the last century. Think of, about it differently. Resolution is not just about waves. It's about waves and states. And I'm convinced that future generations, when you think about a light microscope, they will not just ask for, let me have the best waves and the best lenses, constant best waves. They will say, are there any states in my sample that give me nanometric scale resolution? This is the way you should see the light microscope. And there are already people who do that, not at least the ones in my lab. And by acknowledging them, I would like also to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, time for questions. Uh, we... OK, well, the, thank you very much, Stefan, for the great talk. I'm, um, I'm, I'm a little confused about why you, 
make this big point about nonlinearity and the way you do. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful aspect of STED that it's the saturation of the process that makes the effective size of the donut get smaller and smaller. It's just beautiful. And uh, every one of these functions, like that one, do not have intensity to the first power. So I, I agree with you that that's intrinsically nonlinear. And that's what you said. STED is intrinsically nonlinear. And <clears throat> so, but when you say single molecules is also nonlinear because of the photon business, I, I think you can also view it as being nonlinear in intensity space for the same kind of idea. I mean, as long as the molecule is emitting and you haven't saturated it, signals, of course, will be linear. But when it turns off, you get no light. So, I mean, that's a, the deepest nonlinearity uh, in, in a sense. And, and another way of thinking about it is when you have lots of molecules in a spot and with one on and all the rest off, that's a high order correlation function, that all of those are off and one is on. And so the in, in molecule correlation function has to be uh, intrinsically nonlinear in intensity. So I don't yeah. know why you have to, I just don't understand why you make the distinction the way you, you did. Um, yeah, a very, a very good point. So I'm not saying that nonlinearity is, of course, wrong in no way. So uh, definitely, you can explain everything, say, instead or resolved in nonlinearity. But I'm saying that a nonlinearity view is not the best v a way of seeing it. In the end, it's all about the transition. What you do instead is you make sure that the molecules get to a different state. And of course, you want to get it everywhere except maybe in one particular place where you have one molecule, a few molecules left. It's just a transition. That's the only thing what you do. There are other types of nonlinearities, as you all know, multi-photon excitation process, things like that. They have little or nothing to do with, uh, with the process that we do here, namely just a state transition. Why should I use a concept uh, like a higher, higher concept such as nonlinearity if I don't have to use it? If we just can say, the only thing I'm doing is shifting the molecule from one state to the other, and that's it. By that, I'm just separating the features. That's, that's the story of STAD and RESOLVE, just making a transition. Of course, you can always argue inherently a transition is something nonlinear, nonlinear in terms of the photon, because once it's there, it's there. Uh, you can see it that way, but I think nonlinearity doesn't get me any new insight in this particular case. And of course, I can also see in the, in the, uh, in the, in the palm storm is inherently a nonlinearity, because what you do is, of course, you do a transition, you have a switching, you go from, say, from an off state to an on state, you make definitely sure that it goes to the other state. But then you don't know where it is. And what you do is you localize it. You take, of course, many, 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 many photons. You need them, critically need them, to find out the position. And that is nonlinear in terms of the photons of the order m. And this is also why the images have so zero background or very low background, because you make out of, say, m photons, you make out one event. And so what I'm saying is there is a clear analogy in having, say, nonlinearity using many photons to make sure that the threshold moves in. And of course, taking many photons out in order to make a single, uh, a single event, namely, namely that localization event. And, and seeing it that way helped me, and that's my point, helped me understand the whole, not only the field, but also tell you the weaknesses and the strengths. You can see instantly. I cannot see how you could infer from nonlinearity that in the resolved and the stat case, you need many on-off cycles. I cannot see how you can infer from that. But if I see it that way, I can instantly tell you this concept, stat resolved, needs many on-off cycles, but not many photons. I couldn't infer that from the nonlinearity concept. You see? But from a state transition concept, I can instantly see it, or palm, storm, vice versa. I can instantly see that I need many emission cycles in that concept, but just one on-off cycle. So the ability to fully explain things without having conflicting thoughts uh, makes me put it that way. And again, if you coin, for example, uh, stat or, or, or resolve nonlinear, but then palm or storm nonlinear, I ask, how come that they use the same transitions? They use a cis-trans or a ground state depletion or so. Um, they use the same molecular transitions, but why would that be linear and the other nonlinear? So, so I'm saying it's not a good concept. We should forget it. We should try to look what it is. We just make a state transition to make things separable. In one case, you put in the photons to make that state transition, of course, um, in such a way that we determine where it is in the other way. We do it stochastically and get the photons out and determine the position. That's it. Uh, I'd like the people asking questions. Uh, first, identify yourself, uh, stating your name and uh, names and institutions, please. And what? Name and what? Institution. OK, I'm W.E. Murner. I'm from Stanford University. Um, <clears throat> well, let me, let me put it a different way. You, 
if your fluorescence depletion curve as a function of intensity were linear, then you wouldn't be uh, able to make STED work very well because you, you actually need to have that saturation phenomenon to, in order for the, most of the molecules to be off, right? And, and so, you know, you need to embrace it. I, I don't see really why no. you, I'm, why I'm you not feel like you can't just no, embrace no, it. No, no, W is a mis mis misunderstanding. I'm you not saying, process. no, no, I'm not saying it's not there. I'm, I'm saying it is there, of course. I'm constantly showing thresholds. And of course, anyone who has a training in optics knows threshold means there is, there's a nonlinearity. But you don't need this idea of nonlinearity. The only purpose of that transition is to get it to the other state. And I won't be able to, to be sure that it's in the other state unless I've put in a number of photons, because the cross-section is finite. So I always need a certain heap of photons, say 10,000, to be sure that's in the other state. Because I'm making a state transition in, uh, that makes my, my feature separate for that. In order to make sure that it happens, uh, I have to use a certain amount of photons. That's it. And if you want to call that linear, OK, fully agree. You can call this nonlinear. Fine. But why should I use this ter terminology if I don't need it? If you just need to say I have to push it to the other state, that's it. So my point is, it is kind of not to the point. It's, it makes you think about multi-photon and all kinds of things, and this has little to do with that. People in the past thought, oh, well, maybe with multi-photon, especially physicists, where one can go beyond the diffraction barrier, but no one could show images. Why? Because it's saw the wrong way. They always had photons in mind. I need to have many, many photons to put them in, and then finally I will get something. But it never worked. The state transition, that was the key. Uh, Stefan, uh, Rafa Yuste from Colombia. Yeah. I have a comment on, uh, you mentioned the power that the NB centers have as uh, ideal dyes for super resolution uh, microscopy. Um, and you mentioned that they're um, sensitive to magnetic fields. I just wanted to let the audience uh, be aware of the fact that they're also among the Earth's most sensitive material to electric fields, which means that they could be the ideal uh, material to build uh, voltage uh, indicators in the future. Yeah, very interesting. And the question is, how does it, does it they relate to fluorescence? If you can read it out, say, for, by fluorescence, that may be a way to read out the electric fields. So there's a lot of potential. And of course, temperature. Misha Lukin published very recently um, using the NBs uh, for very sensitively measuring temperature. Please. Hello, I'm Roberto Echenique from University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, you show that you can, with STED, to see the magnetic states of molecules that are very close. Uh, do you think it is possible to, to get some kind of insight of quantum computation uh, using this, this uh, kind of magnetic imaging? I mean, peop I mean, this is one of the reasons why these NVs are currently investigated so heavily is to, they are among the best or perhaps the only candidates right now for single qubits at room temperature. And this is, this is interesting, of course. One can think about using, say, a subdiffraction resolution imaging technique such as that in order to read out um, qubits that are, are very close together. So there is a, say, call it thoughts about it, speculations about it. But that has not come to, um, to a stage of development where I would commit myself that this would, would eventually work. Uh, Stefan, I have a question. Sunny Shea from Harvard. Um, also about the linearity. Now, uh, let's say at the, um, if you have a tiny sample, if, if my interest is, is to determine the number of molecules uh, with certain resolution, right? So uh, I was just thinking about this while you were talking. Uh, I, 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 I think I know the answer, but I want to confirm with you. Now, in the case of a storm or a palm, since I'm counting individual molecules, so the counts are proportional to the number of molecules. Now, for resolve in this scheme, you, since you do have nonlinearity and you know the conversation about, I mean, it's the same transition, right? But uh, in practice, is there any? Nonlinearity that gives you a signal that is not proportional to the number of molecules. Uh, um, it, 
if, if the, I mean, in addition to resolution, I still want to know the, the stoichiometry or uh, the, just the number of molecules, the quantitative microscopy. So in all these methods, um, the signal, of course, that you get in the end is proportional to the number of molecules. So it is a linear function. So that what you get, the image, is a linear function of the local concentration of molecules. That applies to the stat, resolved, palm, storm, and so on. And this is why you can have a point spread function. So, so this, this, linearity, this linearity is always there. Um, and of course, this must not be confused with the nonlinearity discussion that we had before in the sense that you that use fo many photons to, to make a, yeah, a well-defined transition in space or to define the position of, um, of a state in space. Um, I, don't see, um, uh, I don't see the risk of, of having um, um, an image that is not, not proportional to the, um, to, the, to the number of molecules in none of these methods, unless you have other effects like strong photobleaching in both methods, palm storm and stat and so on. And then, that of course, then you, then you introduce a kind of history into your samples, so, and then, uh, and then, you, then you have, have this risk. Otherwise, there is no risk. You wouldn't have it uh, in certain intensity range, or maybe at the air. I mean, you would. OK, I, I think I. Uh, no, I, it's, I, not, I, it's I, not the intensity. That's what I saw. The this, this I is, just want to make sure. What, what you do actually this here is one you do really a transition. You do a transition. And of course, there's two states. And of course, if I'm going for one state, the other, in the end, I'm sure that I'm in the other state. Of course, you can say this is nonlinear because you don't need any photons anymore to get there because you are there already. But it's just a transition. And this is why, personally, I feel I thought about years about this and I really stand to this view. Nonlinearity, although it's valid as a concept, you can explain everything, doesn't get you to the point and it doesn't get you further insights and doesn't definitely not describe to you mathematically, beautifully, what the power and the limitation of each of the techniques we've seen is. And this is why I tend to give it up. But of course, I'm explaining in such a way that people understand it and, and try to get, get away from that thinking. I think this is how it will go down in the end in, in the books, because this is what it is. This is why I'm saying so, so plastically. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, Stefan. Uh, this is Paul Sullivan from the University of Illinois. A very nice talk. Uh, uh, what I'd like to understand is the uh, the second beam, which you're effectively causing, uh, lasing back down from the excited to the ground state. Uh, the question is about the photostability of the of the dyes, and have you gone through and looked at a, a particular number in terms of you know, which dyes are effectively photobleached by the intense beam and which ones aren't? Um, there is no general rule, Paul. Uh, I cannot really uh, give you, um, say, a, a general rule uh, of saying, okay, now this dye should be fundamentally better for, uh, in all cases and this would be, uh, and this would be worse in, in all cases. Of course, in the case of that, if you refer to that, but that applies also to the other methods. There's not just the S0 and the S1. There are other states. There are triplet states, there are high lying states, and of course the molecule may end up in these states and may do something that you don't want. May either blink away or, or entirely, entirely bleach away. Um, I can only say what has worked, because we do many, many experiments and many, many wavelengths, many, many dyes, and as time has passed, more and more and more things have worked. If you go down to the very early papers, you will see that the first 10 papers were made with a single dye, pyridine 2. And people thought, oh, this, that method would work only with one dye. And now you see, fluorescent proteins with even quantum dots. Initially, I thought maybe that's a problem, wouldn't work. Now I know that it works. And um, so by doing the experiment, trying out different things, different pulse duration, different wavelengths, different powers of excitation, I mean, this applies to that. You sort out more and more things, then you know what works, and you do what works. But of course, one has to do it. One has to try um, um, all sets of states. And the same applies, of course, also to the stochastic methods. You, you have to have, of course, um, molecules that emit many photons in a bunch after you got them to the bright state, yeah. isolated. And, and, and this will not be the case for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So in particular, the case of the fluorescent proteins, sure. you know, with POM and STORM, 
people have carefully optimized them to be photostable enough to give you a, a signal. Yeah. And so ha how does that work in terms of the fluorescent proteins, for example? What kind of resolution can you get? I mean, in the, in the STAT case, we get down uh, under living cell conditions to about uh, 50, 40 nanometers. If everything works well, especially the yellow fluorescent protein turned out to be well, GFP also in that ballpark, slightly worse than the yellow fluorescent proteins. But there's the resolve concept. You have the switchable fluorescent proteins. You don't, ha you don't put so much light. You did all the magnitude less light. You have to get the cis-trans working properly. It goes back and forth many times. Once that's sorted out, you can go even further down. So best we had there was something like 25 nanometers. It's not the end. It's the beginning of the story. And this, again, why I believe and really mean it. It's important to understand the basics of it. You really have to understand. When I want to have a palm storm die, it needs many emission cycles, because that will ultimately give me the spatial resolution. It need not go on and off many times, if I want to take just in, in many emission cycles, and vice versa, in, in a resolved mo uh, method. I don't need to have very bright dyes, as for palm storm, but I need to have many on-off switching cycles. This is why I'm very much trying to persuade you to look at it in this way and give up all the concepts of thinking, because this is what it is. And this really explains us why you have to develop dyes like that and like that. In fact, we have dyes, which will fluoresce in proteins that, that work wonderfully with resolved, but they don't work for the stochastic method, and vice versa. Because the two methods have different requirements. They are based on the very same principle of state transition that makes it distinct, but then the way you make the position is different. In one case, we photons that go in, they need the positions. In one case, we have photons that come out, you need the emissions. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. This is Peng Xi uh, from uh, Peking University. I have a comment on the nonlinearity that uh, uh, Sunny has just raised the question. Um, and I would like to have your uh, uh, idea on that. So the, I, the, the term of nonlinear non comes from originally from multi-photon process. And if you think about multi-photon, uh, you realize that uh, the excitation of uh, one 800 is modulated by an, another uh, infra, infrared to get. Um, so if you compare the original uh, PSF generated from the 800 uh, versus the fluorescent, uh, the fluorescent is actually so-called super resolution already. But uh, well, it, it, it cert certainly cannot compete with one uh, single 400 nanometer excitation. Uh, but uh, we, uh, through multiple uh, multi-photon process, it's doable that um, we can get uh, better and better uh, resolution uh, in comparison with the original uh, excitation point spread function. And um, so um, when doing uh, the multi-photon, uh, we have multi-photo in, but one photo, single photon, single fluorescent photon out. So we lose a lot of photon. And instead, and uh, so palm and storm, it has the same thing. Uh, instead, we modulate them down. We turn it off, uh, switch them off. Um, and in Palm and Storm, it's like a uh, um, histogram, and we only take uh, those few photons uh, on the bottom of that so we can localize them. So again, multi photon in, one photon out. So I think the nonlinearity might come from that kind of process. Um, but my point is. If somebody here of the younger generation hasn't heard anything of nonlinearity, you can beautifully explain the power of super resolution without using the word nonlinearity. You will get absolutely to the point without any restriction and fully explain why the method here is strong with those dice and strong with that dice. And you have fully explained it. You don't have to use the word nonlinearity at all. And this is the point that I'm making. I agree. Thank you. More and I think that future generation will think like that, because they will grow up without the historical, say, uh, burden. No more questions? Please join me to thank Stefan for a very exciting, very stimulating keynote lecture. <laughs>